Isaiah, we can start now. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and it says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. There is no beauty that we, sh I'm saying, no sh form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. This basically said he wasn't some charismatic, it wasn't that he was so good looking and charismatic that everybody followed him. Now let's tell you, right now the body of Christ, you could be, uh, have, have a certain look and a certain style and people follow you just because you look. Yeah. Don't matter what your mouth is, what you're saying, that don't mean, mean nothing what's coming out of your mouth, they're all caught up with image. And we are an image driven society, yet the Word of God says Jesus had no form of comeliness and he had no beauty that we should desire him. And in other words, he was, it was nothing, it wasn't like he walked around and people, oh man, that's my guy, that's my kind of guy to follow after. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and we should watch ourselves. Now, we, we, have, we have somebody right now that's on trial here in our own city, politician. And the only reason they made it to the top of the political arena was they, they were grooming him because they thought he had a certain look, thought he was going to be the next JFK, and they groomed him to take that look in that place and shot him up the political ladder for one reason, made him a guy to be a senator. It was basically unheard of, but somebody liked the way he looked, thought he had the potential to have that kind of look and, and get women to vote for him and all that kind of stuff, and they did. <laughs> anyway, a couple of women anyway. <laughs> well, let's leave that there. Um, and, and, but it bombed. You know, but, but really, we're so image-driven. People, that he won the Senate, became a vice presidential candidate, all because of the look. Is that them? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what they're doing, but are they singing? Yeah. Hallelujah. What are they singing over there? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Jungle Book worship. Hallelujah. I just can't tell what this is going on. I just heard a little bit through the wall there. Hallelujah. Uh, but he, in no form, no come. There's no beauty that he should be desired. We don't follow after men because of a certain look. My goodness. You're talking about the immaturity and the dumbing down of the body of Christ. They would follow men because they had a certain look about them. Amen? I can go back and show you videos of Dad Hagen with a striped tie and a plaid coat on. With that awful burnt orange gold backdrop. I mean, it's atrocious. For video, it's one of the most atrocious setups you would ever see. Anyway. Because it says here, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. We just, he is despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, in this passage of Scripture, we have two words. And now, this is, you, you're not going to say, hear anything I haven't heard before. But uh, when you're teaching on healing, there's some things just good to go over and over again. Uh, the word grief comes from koile, C H O I L Y in the Hebrew. And it means from the. Um, Strong's Concordance, disease, grief, or sickness. From the Brown Driver or Biggs uh, Concordance, it simply means sickness. The, he only, they only translate it sickness in their concordance and, and, and study. And then the word sorrow comes from mechab, which means grief, pain, or sorrow. Okay? So grief. So really you could read this. He's a man of grief and acquainted with sickness. Okay? Uh, we had as our, were our faces from him. We esteemed and uh, we despised and esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our griefs. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. And then if you're going down here, uh, well, we just read this whole thing. Uh, as uh, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one into his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was not afflicted. I'm sorry, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is bought, brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Hallelujah. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Now, my, my Bible has a one beside the word death, and in the margin it says Hebrew deaths. And that is in Hebrew, it is plural in the Hebrew. He was and with the rich in his deaths. 
Well, how could he die twice? He died spiritually and physically. So that he could become sin for us. He became spiritually, spiritually separated from the Father so that he could become sin for us so that he could pay the price for our sin nature. Jesus didn't come to pay the price for sins per se. He came to pay, pay the price for the nature of sin. Because he could have just covered the sins, or the actions, but not taking care of the nature. And until the nature was dealt with, it didn't matter how many. See, they, were, they could get the sins, the actions covered every year with animal sacrifices. But only one sacrifice could remove the nature of sin. Hallelujah. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to, or some translate, hath made him to put him to grief, or made him sick. When thou, shalt, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Notice it says the Lord, it pleased the Lord to make him sick. It pleased, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to make him become sin for us who knew no sin. Why? That we might be redeemed. That we might be redeemed. So here Isaiah prophesies of the of God's suffering servant, of the Lamb of God coming into the earth, praise God, of God's holy Son being made sin, sickness, and, and, and our peace, and the chastisement for our peace, all upon him that we might be redeemed. Amen? Now our parallel New Testament scripture is 1 Peter 2.24. And you can really back up just a little bit. Verse 21 says, For even hereto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his step. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, reviled not again. When he was suffered, he threatened not. And when he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Now notice, what, didn't say anything about him being sick and putting up with it. Now, he became sickness for us. Amen? He was reviled. Persecution and uh, attacks because of your walk with the Lord by the enemy, you're, you're to continue to, to suffer reproach like he did. Amen? Verse 24, who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree, that we should be dead to sins, that we being dead to sin should, I left out that, that we, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now you have a lot of people come along on this particular passage and go, oh, see, that's talking about the spiritual sin, that's talking about the spiritual sickness of sin. Well, that's just lovely. I'm glad you came up with that one. You know, um, could you please, please prove that out? Didn't think so. Let's go to Matthew 8. Hallelujah. See, by his stripes you were healed. Well, over in Isaiah it says, by whose stripes we are healed. Peter says, by whose stripes we were healed. Amen. Y'all here? And um, Matthew 8, verse 14 says, And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Now, if Peter has a wife's mother, he had a wife. Hell up. You got a whole group of people running around saying that their ministers can't be married because, and Peter claimed Peter is the first pope. Well, Peter was married. How do you know? He had, a, he had a wife's mother. You don't get a wife's mother without the wife. You don't get a mother in law without the, amen, the wife. Let me say this nobody's going around looking for abstract mother in laws. You hear you're going home. I mean, you, you want some benefits out of the situation, like a wife. It's a joke. It's a mother-in-law joke. Come on, guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I've got an awesome mother-in-law. Praise the Lord. It's good to have a great mother-in-law. Amen. It's no fun when you don't have a good mother-in-law. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand of how many don't have a good mother-in-law. We'll just let you go home and sing mother-in-law. All right, anyway. But when his, he saw his wife's mother laid in sick of a fever, he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she arose, and men who stood unto them. <clears throat> when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Now stop right there. What did he do? He healed all that were sick. Didn't say he forgave anybody's sin. Did it. Now we know he forgives sin. He, he gave, oftentimes he would forgive sin. But he said he cast out the devils and he healed the sick. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah, or, or the, uh, the, the Greek form of Isaiah. 
uh, the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Healing the sick was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that he bore our sicknesses. And here it even quotes it as saying, he took our infirmities or our griefs or sorrows and, amen, and bear our sicknesses. When he healed the sick, they said that fulfilled Isaiah. When Peter quotes Isaiah, you can't change it over to suddenly become something different. When Matthew already established that that was referring to physical ailments. Can somebody say amen? Can I get three people to say Amen. Can I get four? Can I get five? Can I get 400? Got to go get some more folks. All right. Hallelujah. So we see from Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus' ministry, and then the, the, uh, the epistle of doctrine that Peter wrote that Jesus bore our physical diseases and sicknesses for the purpose that we wouldn't have to have them. At the same time, he bore our sin. And took it to the cross. Amen. Uh, Colossians said he took our cross, he took our sins and nailed it to the tree, and took the handwriting ordinances that were against us and nailed it to the cross, took it away from us. Glory to God. Amen. And so uh, understand at the same time that Jesus died on the cross for our physical uh, diseases and, and so forth, he was, he was carrying our spiritual sin nature, became, being made sin for us who knew no sin. Praise God. Look at the 103rd Psalm. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thy thee with good, uh, loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Notice in verse 3 it says, who forgiveth all thy iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. Now, forgiveness of iniquity was the same thing as healing your spiritual uh, sickness of sin. It would only be, need to be stated once. Yeah. It's stated twice because it's referring to two different things. Isaiah refers to two different things. Talks about him bearing our iniquity. 1 Peter 2.24 ref refers to him bearing our sins. But it also refers to our physical sicknesses and ailments. So does Isaiah chapter 53. And here, uh, the psalmist writing, uh, David writing a psalm, says that he, uh, amen, he, for, he, he, heal, he, um, he forgives our iniquities and heals our diseases. See, when you get born again, you don't have, people love to use this term. And it's just a bunch of psychological gooby to got mixed, in, mixed into the Bible. Spiritual healing. Oh, yes. You need spiritual healing. Your spirit don't get healed. Your spirit gets born again. Your soul gets transformed or goes through a metamorphosis. And your body gets renewed, healed and renewed and, and, and kept whole by the Word of God. Your mind gets renewed by the, trans, by the transforming. Amen. I mean, be, not, be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing metamorphosis of your mind or your soul. But the spirit man doesn't get healed. He gets born again. Old things pass away, all things become new. I mean, everything about that old nature is gone in that spirit man. Now your soul has to be transformed. It still thinks stupid. You can have stinking thinking. You need to check up from the neck up and need some spiritual renewal in your brain. Yes. Or, or, or word renewal in your brain so you think right. But your spirit doesn't get healed. Sometimes we'll find scriptures in the Old Testament that say certain things in a certain way, and really there's a lack of understanding because, you know, throughout the Old Testament, they use words for spirit and soul interchangeably, but there's a revelation given in the New Testament. There's clarity brought. Paul writes it. Paul writes in Hebrews and says that the Word of God separates the soul from the spirit. He also writes to the church of Thessalonica in the first epistle, chapter 5, verse 23, that they, he prayed the whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. Three separate entities of man. Man is spirit, soul has soul. Man is a spirit, has a soul, lives in a body. We're not, the, we're not a soul. We have a soul. We are a spirit being. You know, but some of that revelation was, was not clear in the Old Covenant. Well, see, when the New Covenant comes and brings revelation, then what do we do? We pick up the New Testament revelation. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. See, the New Testament revelation supersedes the Old Testament concealing. 
Now, too often people try to go to the Old Testament and try to make the, old, the new fit into the old instead of unveiling the new and allowing the old to find its place in that. Amen. And then you'll get, in tr you'll get in trouble. When you take a New Testament scripture and then run back to the Old Testament and try to shove that in there, make it work, you'll get messed up. Hello. Now somebody came up with something called the Benjamin anointing or the Benjamin generation. Five different anointings. So you're trying to take old New Testament revelation about the anointing and so forth and then run back and find some story about Benjamin getting five changes of clothes and coming up with five different anointings for his life. And teach a whole thing on it. People just running crazy. I'm in the Benjamin generation. I got five changes of anointings. If God meant for it to be five changes of anointings, he'd have said so. Or there would have been a New Testament revelation preached in the Word of God about that. And how God gave five, Benjamin five changes of clothes, which represented five changes of the anointing. He, he knows how to say what he wants. And you don't need somebody coming up with some Lulu brain interpretation that you can't prove out anywhere in the Bible. And that's a Lulu brain. Then that came out of that same devil that was running around about 20 years ago with the Joshua generation. All the young guys were taking over and all the old guys were dying off. The problem was, the typology was that Joshua was 80 when he took over. All the young guys that were hearing this and running off saying, I'm of the Joshua generation, were in their 20s. Get rid of the old guys, I'm taking over. Well, you got another 60 years, dude. Hello? So basically, I mean, that was 20 years ago. They still got 40 years to go to get to the, to fulfill the typology that was given according to their teaching. But see, they don't like that. They just, they just got the little part they like. And say, listen, you can't do that kind of stuff. Amen. So I know in the Old Testament sometimes there are certain scriptures about the soul, the spirit, and, and they seem to say one thing, but you've got to interpret that in the light of what the new says. Amen. So if it makes a reference to the spirit of man or the soul of man and that really line up with how the New Testament teaches that, then we have to take it and say, no, look, this has, this has to come, fall into the New Testament interpretation. Man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. Amen. So you're not a soul. You possess a soul. Amen. Paul said, I, pres I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. God said in the beginning, remember Genesis, let us create man in our image after our likeness, after our kind. And then in the New Testament it says God is a spirit. Not, God is not spirit. God is a spirit. He's not a spiritual, he's not a cosmic cloud out there floating around with V'ger on the inside of it. Little Star Trek reference there, Hallelujah! He's not. He's a, it's not just a force. God's not a force. God is a divine person and personality. He is a. He is a distinct spirit. Amen. He is a spirit. He is not spirit. See, when you just say he is spirit, that can be kind of cosmic y Lulu stuff. You can get real weird with that. It's like I had, I had a discussion with a guy on Facebook about a month ago. He said, Love is, you know, God is love, therefore love is God. And I said, No, you can't say it that way. You can't ever convince me otherwise. I know because the Bible says God is love, that means that love is God. So I just went and did about five word studies, copied them, cut and pasted it, and said, now, the Greek has the article in front of God and does not have it in front of love, making God, God is love. But because of the way it's written and the structure of, that, of the way the God moved on the people to write, you can't reverse it. There's no article in front of the word love. You could not reverse the, the statement. In other words, God is love. Love comes out of God. But this love floating around here is not, the, is not God. You can't commune with this love that's going on out here. This love out here doesn't, doesn't come and walk with you and talk with you. No, it comes from God. See, the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? That, that, that characteristic or that, that trait of love is in our spirits because it came from God. But, and though God is like, it also says he's light. That, does that mean the light running around this room is God? No. <laughs> See, that's, that's where you get weird. People start getting cosmic -y and weird. You know? It also says that he's life. So anything that has life in it, does that mean that? And that's where you get your, your weird Eastern religions, you know, that all life, or even your, your uh, Metachlorian Jedi religion, 
You know, that all living things create this, the force, which is basically the, the, the Eastern mindset that all life con combined is God. Well, see, the New Testament says God is light, God is life, God is love. He is those things, but they are not him. Yeah. They, they may proceed out of him. He may, uh, each one of those things may be part of his characteristic, but they in and of themselves are not God as an entity. Amen. Are you here? God is light. God is life. God is love. But light, life, and love is not God. Well, I just believe it. So, well, I don't care what you believe. You can believe anything. You can believe you're a duck. They'll make you a duck. You can go out in your car and go, boom, boom. They'll make you a motorcycle. <laughs> you can put a picture of you and put your face on the front end of a motorcycle and say, I'm a motorcycle. You can say, I'm a motorcycle all you want to. You're not ever going to be a motorcycle. You're a human being. You'll be, you'll be a human being. Always. Amen. So man is a spirit, possesses a soul, and lives in a body. Amen. Sin deals in the spirit of man. Now, we have actions of sins that are carried out in the flesh, but they are birthed in the heart. Amen. As a thought and a seed which produces the action. Sins are, were, were birthed and were birthed into the earth through sin nature. Until Adam committed high treason by rebelling against God and, 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 and doing what God told him not to do, he was alive under God. The moment he chose to go against that, he became spiritually dead. Satan became his spiritual father, and now his nature was to sin. And from that point, all man denigrates. Man goes downhill. Right now, and I'll be honest with you, I don't see how, how it, it may could, but I don't see how it's going to pass, is the marriage amendment. You got pastors telling the churches to vote against it. It's going to be, it's, it's, it's a hate, it's a hate bill. Saw a sign the other day somewhere, vote against the marriage amendment. It'll hurt the children. I mean, you, you just got to pull off the side of the road and go, what demon-possessed dodo brain came up with that one? How is it going to hurt? Actually, pa not passing it and not having the institution of marriage preserved hurts the children. Well, the children. See, I don't believe. I don't believe they should have children. I don't believe homosexuals should be able to adopt, raise children, and have a social experiment in identity politics. I don't believe they should be able to do that. I don't think you should have to have a bathroom because some man send, identifies himself as a woman and has on a dress. It's, it's, it's this identity politics. Sins of the sin, sin starts spiritually, manifest physically. Yeah, yeah, right. There are physical sickness is 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 the is the result of sin in the earth, and that result causing the human body because it's been attacked by sin, born of sin. Everybody's born in sin. So your body becomes susceptible. You're death doomed when you're born. Adam would have lived forever. Had it, and all of humanity would have never died and been separated from God had Adam not committed high treason. We'd all been alive unto God. There would not have been a fall of the race. We would not have died physically. We would have reached maturity in adulthood and stayed there. Pretty cool, huh? Now you got crazy people who want to wipe out the humans on the planet because they, um, they're the problem with the planet. No, the planet was made to take care of all of us. Yeah. God designed it that way. Hello. You can go out here and, and, and uh, somebody can go behind a tree and, and relieve themselves behind a tree and it goes into the earth. Eventually it ends up in your drinking water. But by the time it does, it's gone through the, the soil and the clay and the rock strata and entered into the underground tables. And by the time it gets all down there, it's been cleansed. God made the earth to cleanse itself. He designed it. Hallelujah. You breathe out. Are you here? And you breathe out a, what could become to you in a, in a situation if you were in an enclosed room 
with no ventilation at all, totally sealed off, put you in that room, lock the door and seal it, eventually you would die in the process of your breathing. Because you would extract the oxygen, the O2 out of the air, and you would release a carbon dioxide which you cannot breathe and get anything out of. Yet, in that same room, if you were to put a tree in there, yeah. plants in that room, sufficiently watered, you would not use up the oxygen because the air that you breathe or the, the exhale or the, uh, of your breath would be absorbed by the plant and it would release oxygen back into the room. God designed it that way. Amen. Amen. God had a master plan. Amen. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. God created man in a class of being like himself. Spirit beings. We were not to fall. We were not to fail. We were not. We did. Adam did. And uh, I'll tell you one thing. When I get to heaven, I'm marching right straight over to Adam's house. We're going to have a discussion. <laughs> dummy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now God created man as a spirit being. When Adam fell in the garden, we began to see for the first time sickness, disease, poverty, all these things begin to take place on the earth, death, things that never happened, could not have, would, could not have happened until that happened, until man he died spiritually and then opened the door. So sickness is the result. Now, what, what I'm trying to say this in this way. Sickness is in the earth because of the fall of man. does not mean because somebody's sick they just went out and sinned last week. It is a result of sin, but not necessarily a personal sin. Does that make sense? It entered, it entered into the human gene pool, as it were, the susceptibility to disease and sickness because of the original fall of man, and that's been passed on to all mankind. Does it, remember um, the disciples one day, they, they saw a man blind, and they turned to Jesus and said, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And he said, neither. Now, you, most people will go ahead and say, because the King James translates, that neither this man or his parents sin, but that the works of God might be fulfilled. I must work the works of him while that's light. And everybody goes, see, Jesus, he was born blind, so Jesus could heal him. And I'm born blind, like that man. Well, why aren't you healed? Hello? People, you go, people want to claim stuff, we'll read the whole story. He got healed. He was born blind or crippled, I forget. I'm, I'm kind of going to make sure I... Um, who sinned, him or his parents? He said, neither. And he healed them. Healed them. Amen. Well, you know, they were made that way, so, you know, in the Bible, so Jesus would come on and heal them. That's great. If you believe that, that's fine. Then that means that everybody that's born, so you go around and say he's born that way, he's getting ready to get healed. So if you get the Bible to them and show them what the Bible says, they should be getting healed. Because they were born that way, we should be having them come into our churches to get healed so everybody can see that God heals. See, people, people like to tell their stories the way they like to tell their stories so that it works for their doctrine. Why don't we just follow what the Bible says? No, God wants you well. I said, God wants you well. Amen? God wants you healed. Jesus came and bore your sicknesses. Now, since sin is spiritual, and sickness, now sickness is a result of a spiritual fall, but it attacks the physical body. Amen. Now, you can be in sin and cause sickness to come. You can open the door. I mean, homosexuality opened up a whole gate, floodgate of a disease called AIDS. Hello. If you go back and study your history, um, bestiality caused a lot of uh, STDs down in South America when the Spaniards got there. Hello. And that's just sick. They thought llamas looked good. Amen. And they paid the price for it. Well, let me say something here. That was sin. Yeah. Nasty sin. Go ahead, Janice. Tell me. Nasty. 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 That's some nasty sin. 
Now, they reaped in themselves the just recompense of reward. They engaged in sinful activity and it cost them physically. Hello? And then it got, it got into the human population because of it. You know, homosexual activities, it's, it's amazing. Had, 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 had AIDS been something else other than what it, what it became a political disease, they would have quarantined people with it. Instead, they got laws passed, you couldn't tell anybody that somebody had it. It was against the law for a doctor to tell somebody that person has AIDS. They weren't required to tell anybody. That's just the devil. Then it got into the heterosexual population. So why? So they could all say this is just, it's, it's, it's not a homosexual disease. It's, it's, a, it's a sexual disease that, that it, all people, kinds of people are dealing with. Well, yeah, when you, when you allow it to spread into the other populace, it does. Yeah. But sin brought that. Sin brought that. Hello. Y'all here? You gone home? Well, so sometimes sin can bring sickness. But on the other hand, sick, you, could, you could be totally walking with the Lord, not, and not involved in sin, and sickness come by and visit you, and you get a hold of it. Don't, don't, don't take it. Why? Because it's in the earth. The fallen, state, the fallen state of man allowed that in the earth. Your body's not been glorified, so you're still susceptible to that unless you take the Word and stand on the Word. Amen? So we don't want to judge people all because they got sick all the time, but sin they're involved in. But we do know that some, certain sins will cause sickness to come. Being stupid will get sickness in you. Now, my wife had a co-worker um, that, where they work, and they had, had, had a hangnail, and pulled up, it, it was inflamed and infected, and was using, the, they deal with students, students' pencils and pens. With that finger, it got a staph infection in it. The finger turned black up to the first knuckle, and they told her she was going to have it amputated if it didn't get better by the next day. And Janie prayed for her. Amen. And by the, she went back to the doctor, it was already getting better. But, see, that wasn't something she did as far as sin. That was just that was stupidity. And when you just don't take everybody's, you know, they got in the mouth, behind their ear. I mean, if you do all kinds of stuff, you, you, you've seen them. Somebody, somebody, and you come up to a, go to a restaurant and the waiter comes, here's my pencil. You think, uh, what kind of earwax mess they got behind your ear? Nasty stuff. I don't want your pencil. Can you bring me one that's been sanitized? <laughs> in, in a sanitation package, you know, that you have to rip out and pull out. <laughs> Amen. They lick them, stick them in the mouth. Some people rub them in the nose. <laughs> Hallelujah. That'll make you think next time you grab a pencil somewhere to sign something on it. <coughs> Jaheem said, that's disgusting. <laughs> well, see, you didn't, people didn't get something. She didn't get something because she was sinning. Yeah. She was using wisdom. So what am I trying? I'm trying to make you understand sickness is in the earth. It started because of a spiritual event, but now it's in the earth. And so we need to deal with it and understand that the Word of God still has something to deal with that. Now, we understand that if, we're, if you know, and listen, you know, how many people know you're in sin? For sure? You? And God. Hello? And if you know it, deal with it. It's that simple, isn't it, brother, brother Benny? It's that simple. If you know it, deal with it. You don't. You don't have to. <laughs> Messing with Jaheem over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jans and Jerry say, hey, Pastor, we're here. I know you're here. Jaheem, what's up, dude? <laughs> Hallelujah. So sin is, is a spiritual thing. Although sin, sickness started out of that spiritual thing, it's just now and there. You got germs and viruses just floating around out there. And just because you get, it, it attaches to you and you have to deal with it doesn't mean you were in sin. Right. It could, you could be, but you're not necessarily. So if you're not, don't get all freaked out about it. Just deal with it. Mm -hmm. If you know there's sin in your life, deal with it. Amen. Isn't that right? So... 
we find out from the Word of God that Jesus came and bore our sin, and he also bore our sicknesses. From Isaiah 53, 1 Peter 2, 24, Matthew 8, uh, Psalm 103. He carried those things so we wouldn't have to. Amen. He dealt with this. He wants to listen. Even if, think about it this way. Even if you even if you had sin that caused a sickness, you can go to John, James <laughs> chapter five. Thank God for James chapter five. What's that do? That covers it if you really messed up and caused it because you were you were in sin. He said over in James five. He said, Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save or heal. Remember the word sa save in the, in the Greek is sozo. It can also be translated healed, made whole, restored. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Praise the Lord. You can get it all in one wipe, in one shot. Amen? I said, You can get it all in one shot. Glory to God. Healed and, and forgiven. Amen. Dad Hagen said he used to preach a sermon a number of years ago called Sickness and uh, Forgiveness and Healing, the God's Double Cure. Amen. Well, I believe in it. I believe God can forgive you and heal you at the same time or for heal you and forgive you at the same time. Amen.